In this video, I'm going to go over the readings for this week, which are about Darwin and Wallace. Um, and so I'll have to give you a bit of background about Wallace, which is what I'll start with here. So the reading is largely a reflection on the impact or the lack thereof of social forces on science. So we talk, well, it talks quite a bit about Victorian England. And so Victorian England is where Darwin and Wallace basically grew up. Um, so Darwin is born in England and sort of is clearly an Englishman. Wallace is technically born in Wales, um, but his nationality is somewhat in dispute. He referred to himself as an Englishman. Either way, they both grow up basically in the same society. Um, so Victorian here refers to the reign of Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1837 to 1901. Uh, and by all accounts, it was pretty rough if you were poor. It was a rough place to live, uh, which a lot of people were poor during this period. So if, if you were, for example, too poor to support yourself, you got sent to a workhouse uh, and where you would be fed enough to survive and be put to work. Um, if you've read or seen a version of Oliver, uh, Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, you know what this is about. So Oliver Twist grew up in a workhouse. Um, Hull, the author of this week's readings, writes, quote, of the children put in workhouses, 85% died before they were old enough to leave. So rough. If you're, if you're poor in Victorian English, England, things are rough. Um, so one fairly common thought expressed about the relationship between the theory of evolution and the kind of social context that emerges from, from both Darwin and Wallace is that the very competitive kind of doggy dog nature of Victorian society is reflected in the theory. So either the generation of the theory was reflected in, uh, was, was sort of influenced by Victorian society or the reception of the theory was influenced by Victorian society. Uh, so, uh, that's the that's the sort of thought that Hull's going to consider in the in the readings for this week. Is there or isn't there good reason to think that the nature and character of Victorian society is reflected in the way they wrote both Darwin and Wallace the theory of evolution? Okay, so uh, there are certainly common intellectual influences on Darwin and Wallace. So, for example, both of them had read Thomas Malthus's work. So Thomas Malthus had was an economist who argued that there's always going to be fewer resources than are, are needed to kind of keep the society going. Well, not, not at every single point, but he points out that populations can grow exponentially. So you have, you and your partner have four kids and each of those kids have four kids and so on and so on. So populations can grow at this really, really rapid rate, whereas increase in resources tends to only ever be linear. So He's thinking, for example, of developing new farmland to produce enough food to support people. That doesn't happen at an exponential rate. It tends to happen at a linear rate. And when you have exponential population growth, linear growth in resources, those two curves are going to crash into each other in a pretty nasty way, and you'll get starvation or some other really serious resource limits. So we should, Thomas or Malthus argues, we should more or less expect populations to be kept in check by terrible starvation every once in a while. So this picture of how populations relate to resources is something that both Darwin and Wallace had on the, had in the back of their mind while they're thinking about the natural world. Malthus is writing about economics, uh, but Darwin and Wallace are both naturalists. They're thinking about natural populations and seem to have applied something of this theory to their thinking about how natural populations change over time. Okay, so, and if you lived in London in the 1700s, I think it would be pretty easy to believe Malthus's theory. So, uh, in, the, in the century from 1700 to 1800, London went from 1 million people to 6 million people. That's a lot, right? Like, it's a huge increase. And the rich did fine, um, but the poor people had a really rough go of it. So, there were really crammed slums full of violence and disease and quite a bit of starvation. Uh, the air was thick with gross smoke from like coal fires, uh, heat and cook. Uh, like it was, it was, it was pretty grim in the, in the slums of London of the 1700s. And this really rapidly increasing population in the city looked a lot like what Malthus thought was going to happen. Okay. So, uh, the main question for the readings of this week is, are things like the way Victorian society kind of leaves people to their 
own devices in the sense of like it's it's every man for himself in in Victorian England and the kind of rapidly increasing population in in big cities like London are those social factors important for understanding the development of the theory of evolution by Darwin and Wallace so recall we talked earlier in this course about internalism and externalism sort of internal narratives of the history of science and external narratives where internal narratives are Stories about how ideas change ideas, right? So the arguments and the evidence available to, to scientists are understood to be the main driving force shaping how science changes over time. And externalism is this idea that sort of social factors extrinsic to science play a big role. Um, and Hull, Hull quite uh, correctly notes that this split, I mean, you're very, very unlikely to find a real living historian that, that proudly states, like, I am an internalist or I am an externalist. The, the split is a little too, the split itself is a little too simple. I think everybody accepts that there are some internal and some external factors, and the question is about which one of them is more important in a given case. So Hull is going to ask, in this specific case, so in the case of Darwin and Wallace developing the theory of evolution, does this externalist story hold water. And he's going to say no. He's going to say he doesn't think that you can make a solid case for the conditions of Victorian society, society influencing the development of the theory of evolution. Okay. okay, so to see why, let's talk a little bit about this other inventor of the theory of evolution, Alfred Russell Wallace. So uh, Wallace came from England, uh, what, what becomes the UK, uh, around the same time as Darwin. But as Hall points out, he lived a very different life. And I said just a minute ago that they grew up in the same society. Hall wants to say that in important sense, they lived in different societies. So the important difference is Wallace was pretty poor, whereas Darwin was a, a country gentleman. So like Darwin, Wallace spent a lot of time sailing around the world uh, in South America and in Indonesia, and he was doing observations of the natural world. So he's got a very similar base of observations and experience to draw on. But Darwin was traveling with the Royal Navy. He was on a Royal Navy ship. He was given a salary. He was, uh, sort of like paid by the government to accompany this journey. Uh, Wallace came from a substantially less wealthy background. So he had Wallace had no formal education beyond the age of about 14, although he did a bunch of self-educating, uh, and he had to pay for his own trip. Uh, so Wallace made his money, well, he tried to make his money um, by collecting a bunch of specimens. So like, uh, you know, collecting an example of a plant or an animal that would be preserved and then shipped back to England to be sold to private collectors. And if you recall from the lecture about Galileo, this was a popular way of sort of showing your, your uh, cultural and economic richness was to have a kind of private collection of a, a sort of stuffed animals, basically. So uh, Wallace, I say he tried to do this because the first trip he went on, his boat burned and sank and he lost almost everything, which is pretty unfortunate. But he, uh, he did have another successful trip where he got to bring some samples back and sell them. Um, but he was, he's kind of scraping by. Wallace is kind of scraping by. So he's not experiencing Victorian society in the same way that Darwin was experiencing Victorian society. They had very different sort of social experiences, even of the same country at the same time. So Hull thinks that the idea that they were products of the same society is maybe a bit too quick, right? Okay. So, uh... Darwin had been working on his theory for about 20 years, as I said in the last lecture, uh, slowly gathering evidence and arguments, crafting this big book. And then, as he says, like a bolt from the blue, Wallace writes him this letter explaining his own theory to him. Uh, Wallace, in a very brief sort of letter, lays out the theory of evolution by natural selection and wondered, you know, Darwin, what do you think of this? And by the way, can you pass this on to some of your scientists' friends so that I can get some feedback on it? Um, this was this was surprising to Darwin. It was a bit. It was a it was a shock, as you can probably imagine. Um, but he actually he uh, acted fairly decently about it. So uh, at the time that he received this letter, Darwin was pretty preoccupied because the the town that he lived in was a. a 
overcome by scarlet fever. So there was a, a, it's hard for you to imagine, but there was a bad disease going around at the time. It was occupying a lot of his attention. Um, so Darwin's friends actually came together and uh, convinced him to let them read both some writing by Wallace and by Darwin at the Linnaean Society. So the Linnaean Society is a scientific society in the same basic mold as the Royal Society, but their their focus was on sort of biology and the natural world. Um, so in order to establish Darwin's priority, that is to say, in order to establish that Darwin had the idea at least at the same time as Wallace, he actually seemed to have had it quite a bit before, but in order to establish sort of publishing priority, his friends rush him to sort of produce a very short version of the story that then gets read out of a scientific society, which is our equivalent of, what, for us, the equivalent would be publishing it in a journal. So you get your name attached to this, the, the idea so that nobody else can take credit for it. I say this was a pretty decent move on Darwin's part. I suspect that he had enough social clout and connections that if he decided to bury Wallace, he probably could have. That is to say, Wallace was a kind of marginal member of society. He didn't have the connections. He didn't have the clout to convince people that he came up with this first. If Darwin had just gone to the Linnaean Society and said, hey, everybody, I had this great idea, evolution by natural selection, he probably could have written Wallace out of the history books if he decided to. So looking at this event, Hall thinks that it doesn't make much sense to say that Darwin and Wallace's theories were shaped by the kind of local social forces that were acting on them. Uh, especially since Darwin and Wallace face such different versions of English society. Uh, basically, he wants to argue that the externalist story that's actually pretty common trying to explain how and why Darwin came up with this theory and how and why it got accepted by his society doesn't hold much water. Um, so about the reception of the theory, Hull notes, at first people didn't really react all that strongly to it. It wasn't like people, you know, jumped up out of their chairs and were, were like, oh my God, God doesn't exist. Wow. Um, Hull says that at the time of the reading of these two papers of the Linnaean Society, it caused, quote, hardly a ripple. Um, the president of the Linnaean Society said later uh, that that year had not, quote, been marked by any revolutionary discoveries, which is, uh, whew, that's rough. It's a, it's, a, it's a rough review of your idea. Um, so right off the bat, people didn't, People didn't react very much to this, this idea. Um, it wasn't until Darwin published his much longer and more detailed account of the theory that people started to take notice. So the first run of the, his, his big book, The Origin of Species, which this isn't really his big book. He had a much bigger book planned. He compressed it into The Origin of Species, which is still a pretty substantial book. Um, but The Origin of Species is not just the idea of evolution by natural selection. What it is, is it, uh, one big long argument trying to establish that we can see evidence of this in the natural world. So he goes through all kinds of features of all kinds of living things. He considers possible problems and develops counter arguments to them. So he really lays out the case in tons and tons of detail backed up by tons and tons of evidence. So that's what kind of caught people's imagination, not just the raw idea of evolution by natural selection. Okay. So externalists, of course, cite the very competitive nature of Victorian society as one of the reasons why Darwin's theory won acceptance. The idea goes, the world was so doggy dog uh, that, you know, when you frame the natural world as a kind of competition between organisms for survival and the resources necessary to reproduce, People were like, yeah, that sounds right to me. That's what my life is like. That's probably what the world is like. Um, but careful historical work, Hall reports, shows that that's not really how people reacted. So people at the time were pretty okay with the idea. They, they, when Darwin presented this idea of evolution by natural selection, there's a couple parts. One of them is that species change over time. Okay, people were fine with that. Actually, they, they thought the idea that species change slowly over time was a pretty acceptable idea. What they rejected was Darwin's explanation for the mechanism. So the mechanism of change in Darwin is, at least one of the central mechanisms is natural selection, the competition between organisms and the fitter organisms more likely to get their uh, genes into the next generation. People thought that sounded suspect. So 
right off the bat, people accepted the part that has nothing to do with the competitive nature of Victorian society and kind of rejected the part that did fit with that. So Hull thinks that the externalist story there just doesn't really work either. Okay. Um, and I want to just add a little bit to Hull's narrative because I think it's interesting to note that uh, Wallace had a very different take on the theory as it pertained to you know, how it should influence our thinking about our own society. Uh, of course, there were people who thought Darwin's theory shows pretty clearly that, you know, lying and cheating and is great and fine because nature is just one big competition, right? They, there were people who heard Darwin's theory and thought, ah, science has proved that my cheating my tradesmen out of their pay is a perfectly good and natural thing to do because that's what nature is and that's how species improve. So some people heard this and thought, ah, competition, that's the greatest thing ever. But Wallace himself, who presumably understood the theory that he also invented, um, had a very different take on it. Uh, Wallace, was, Wallace was a socialist. And despite some people taking a kind of hyper-competitive message from the theory, Wallace saw it quite, quite differently. So he said things like, for example, groups in which cooperation is more dominant will be more effective as a group than groups in which inter... Uh, group competition is more dominant. So if you've got a, one group in which there's tons and tons of competition between the members and one group where all the members are cooperating, the cooperative group is going to be more effective than the competing group. Therefore, he predicted cooperation would slowly take over the world, right? So cooperation would become the dominant way of organizing people. Um, he thought that inheritance in the sense of like when... when when somebody dies, their kids getting their money, actually distorted the process of natural selection in humans. So uh, inheritance means that people who are getting a leg up who didn't earn it for themselves. So inheritance, he thought, should be abolished. Uh, and furthermore, the subjugation of women, which was uh, going pretty strong in Victorian England, um, the subjugation of women interferes with what Darwin explained as sexual selection. So in many species, uh, Darwin argued there's uh, sexual selection, which is the female chooses who to mate with, uh, and males compete for female attention. And Wallace sort of, he didn't, Wallace didn't come up with the idea of sexual selection. That seems to be something that was just in Darwin. But having heard about it from Darwin, he found that he thought that uh, the subjugation of women interfered with this process of natural selection, which would be good for the human race. Therefore, women should be emancipated. So those were the lessons that Wallace took from the theory of evolution, radically different lessons than a lot of other people took. Um, so this is about the reception and the kind of lesson that comes out of the theory of evolution. And I think that it's pretty clear that there's no one lesson that you get from it, right? So different people seem to not, not make up but or project, but like, Different people took very different morals from this story. So I don't think that there's any straight line from the science influencing society here either. There's many different lessons that you could take from the theory of natural selection and your pre-existing worldview. So Dar Wallace came into this a socialist. He came out of it a socialist. Darwin went into it a fairly standard English conservative, and he came out of it a fairly standard English conservative. So. Uh, just to add on to Hull's theory or thoughts a little bit, I don't think that the science really made anybody in this story change their politics either. So politics didn't really seem to change the science, and science didn't really seem to change the politics. Okay, so to sum up, uh, Hull doesn't really think the evidence for externalism in this case holds up very well. Um, that's not to say that there aren't close interconnections between science and society throughout this period. Like, just the ability to, so as, as I mentioned at the very beginning of the last lecture, both Darwin and Wallace got to have the base of observations that they used to build their theory because they went on so-called journeys of discovery. They sailed around the world seeing a bunch of natural, uh, natural living things that they wouldn't have seen otherwise. So science and society are, throughout this whole story, deeply intertwined, but not in the, at least Hall's arguing, not in the straightforward way that the a purely external uh, account of the history of natural selection would suggest. Okay.
That's it for this week. Thanks.